Hello everyone and welcome to another News Coulomb video. This last weekend I went on a road trip from Ventura, California up to the north rim of the Grand Canyon in Arizona and I thought I'd share it with you. I'm going to use a slightly different format for this video, so let me know how you like it, and if you do like it, then I'll try to do more of my road trip videos sort of in this format moving forward. I know a lot of you prefer some sort of a synopsis and a breakdown of how the trip went, rather than actually sitting alongside watching me drive. I only had a two-day weekend to make this trip in the Bolt EV, so I made sure I got to work early because I knew I would need to leave early in order to beat Los Angeles traffic getting out through Las Vegas on a Friday night. Unfortunately for me though, I still ran into traffic. The fastest route to get from Ventura out to Victorville was actually delayed by an hour and a half, so I was forced to take the back route and even that was delayed by over 20 minutes. So by the time I got to Victorville, I really had to use the bathroom. The problem with this is I didn't really have to charge. There was a leaf using the CCS Chatamo station. So I figured, well, I'll just stop for now, plug in, and go get dinner while I wait because typically the EVgo stations will allow you to queue up behind another electric vehicle so your session starts automatically. I knew I only needed about 10 to 15 percent added to my battery to feel safe in making the rest of the trip from Victorville to Baker. The only problem was the charger didn't activate. So while it took me 30 minutes to eat dinner and come back, when I got back the car wasn't charging. To make matters worse, this charger used to be 125 amps. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, EVgo has downgraded this charger to 100 amps, which is more than 25% slower than charging on 125 amp. The reason for that is the Bolt EV, after 51%, steps down to 105 amp charging. So it's already wanting to charge faster than the charger can provide. But it also means that there's no additional power from the charger to run the Bolt EV's battery conditioning and air conditioner. That means this charger charges way slower than it needs to. And after talking with the sole EV owner who arrived at a similar time, the reason everybody was piling up on this single charger was, well, the Chatamo only station is broken. So I'm really down on EVgo right now because after putting in the Baker charger, they basically opened up the route for shorter range, small battery electric vehicles to make the trip from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. The problem is Victorville is still a bottleneck. After a short, about 15 minute session there actually charging, I was back on my way. By the time I arrived at Baker, however, I was already way behind schedule. The charge in Baker went extremely well. It was a very picturesque. I got there right as the sun was setting. It was a wonderful sort of time to be there. There's a new shop and market and restaurant opening up next to the EVgo chargers there. So it's going to make it a really nice stop moving forward. Now when I was in Baker, I charged a little bit higher into the battery state of charge because again, as I was saying, 125 amp chargers in the Bolt EV actually charge faster than 100 amp chargers all the way up to about 68% battery. So even though there's that step down in charging rate, it's still better to charge longer than on a 125 amp charger than it is to be stuck charging that same amount on a 100 amp charger. So the drive into Las Vegas was actually fine. I think a lot of the congestion was still stuck behind me just trying to get out of Los Angeles. But unfortunately, the problem with Las Vegas is all of their charging stops are 100 amp or less, and they're all dispersed around the city, and there's really only one charger per location. So when I planned my trip out, I decided I would stop at the closest Las Vegas charger, the one that's the farthest west in the city. 
Now, the problem with that, though, is it puts me even farther away from my next stop in St. George than I would really care to be. So when I arrived in Vegas, I had about 23% battery. The trip from Las Vegas up to St. George, Utah, it's about 140 miles on fast freeways. I really didn't want to have to slow down while traveling, so I left with about 74% battery. And it's a good thing, too, because when I arrived in St. George, I only had about 3% battery left. Now I could have slowed down and I could have had a much larger buffer, but I was very confident in my ability to make it to that charger. So I would rather drive quickly and end with a lower battery than slow down and end with battery capacity that I didn't really need to save anyway. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about this Maverick's first adventure stop uh, in St. George, Utah, and technically it's Washington, north of St. George. There are a lot of things I really like about it, but there are a few things that I'm not necessarily happy about or I think should be improved or I would like to see made better. It is at a well-lit location that's open 24 hours a day. However, there's only one DC fast charger there, which means that as longer range of electric vehicles start to become more prominent, it's going to be really easy to show up there and not be able to DC fast charge. Now, one thing they've done that I do like is they have a supplementary level two charger on site. So even if you can't DC fast charge or the DC fast charger is down, you're not completely stranded. But then there's also the pricing. Now, I understand that this is an electric vehicle charging as a service. So using that to sort of inform my expectations, I understand why it's a bit on the expensive side. But to give you an idea of just how expensive it is, it's a $2 activation, and I thought it was $0.35 cents per minute, which would be expensive, but it was actually $0.35 cents per kilowatt hour. It ended up costing $15.73. So basically for about 120 to 130 miles, it ended up costing me over $15. That's more than 10 cents a mile, which is extremely high for an electric vehicle, even if you're talking about using DC fast charging. That's about double what I typically pay on something like an EVgo or many other charge point stations that I've used. I didn't arrive at my motel until about 3 a.m. Utah time, but they have Tesla destination chargers which made it a more convenient stop for me. And I had thought that maybe this was going to be the first trip that I had to use my JDAPTER in order to complete the trip successfully. It turns out that after driving it, I realized that I didn't really need to. It added a small level of convenience. But really, I could have done just as well and saved a decent amount of money actually stopping in St. George, Utah, like I had done the trip before when I had visited Zion National Park and left St. George with the full battery early in the morning. And I would have still been able to complete my trip in much the same way that I did. And that's all because the destination chargers in St. George at their best Western motels have Clipper Creeks as well. So there's really no need for the JDAPTER. However, I would encourage people to consider having one because a lot of the destination chargers, even the ones with J1772 Clipper Creeks on site, they do have the Tesla destination chargers as well. So if there's something wrong with the station or if they're occupied, it just gives you a little bit more flexibility in your travel plans. At the motel, I charged up to 100% battery, and the reason for it is, from this point forward, I really didn't know that much about what I was getting into. I drove around Kanab a little bit because I wanted to grab some breakfast, and then I had to go to the visitor center to pick up my annual National Parks Pass. Now, that's $80 for the annual pass, but just to drive a car through a national park at this point is $35. So if you visit two national parks in a year, basically you're only down another $10. So it just makes sense. Because after all, I visited two national parks just in this weekend alone. Kanab, Utah is about 5,000 feet above sea level in terms of elevation. So I had already 
gone quite a bit up in terms of elevation. For those of you who don't know, the Bolt EV will typically use about 1.5 kilowatt hours of additional energy for every thousand feet of elevation it increases. So I had already used an additional 7.5 kilowatt hours of energy just getting up to Kanab in the first place. The north rim of the Grand Canyon is actually about 9,000 feet. So even though I'm at 5,000 feet of elevation in Kanab, I still had another 4,000 feet of elevation to go up. Along the route, I decided to stop and get a scenic view of the Grand Escalante. It was a wonderful stop. A lot of people were there. You get to look down on the valley and see all of the colors. Along my route heading up from Kanab, that's when I started to run into what was probably my biggest challenge of the entire trip. And that is there was a really strong wind blowing out of the south and west. Now, as I was making my way up the mountain, these gusts were getting increasingly more powerful. As I was heading up, I was actually worried about the impact that these could have on my efficiency because I could feel the actual wind blowing against the side and the front of the car. I made a quick stop at Jacob Lake along the way, and this is right at under 8,000 feet elevation. It's a wonderful place, and it's right where it sort of splits off, and you can continue going off toward Flagstaff and actually the other side of the Grand Canyon. My efficiency getting up to Jacob Lake was actually really, really poor. It took me about 12 kilowatt hours just to go the 40 miles, really the halfway point from Kanab up to the Grand Canyon. So I was a little bit worried about my efficiency heading up. I knew I wouldn't be charging at the Grand Canyon because there were no power outlets at the campsites. So I needed to make sure I had as much battery as I could. However, the uh, Bolt EV was a champ and I can't complain about it at all. By the time we had leveled off at about 8,000 feet, we really only had about 1,000 feet more to climb before dropping down into the Grand Canyon National Park. By the time I arrived at the gates of the Grand Canyon, it was about 24 hours exactly from when I left the office. It was a nice feeling to know that that time, the day before, I was sitting in an office at my desk working. A day later, I was at the gates of the Grand Canyon National Park. So that was really exciting for me. And it turned out that I was really worried about the efficiency for nothing. I ended up arriving with just under 21 kilowatt hours used. Given that I was only spending the night and I would be leaving the following morning, upon arriving and checking into my camp, I immediately decided to go for a hike. Now the wonderful part about this camping spot that I have is you're literally just a few hundred feet from the edge of the Grand Canyon. I just had to walk down a quick trail, the transept trail, and I was right at the edge of the Grand Canyon. It's an awe-inspiring sight. I, I hope you all have a chance to visit. After having visited the south rim of the Grand Canyon, also in my Bolt EV, and now having visited the north rim of the Grand Canyon, I can say that I do like the north a lot better. There are so many trails, there's so much diversity, there's so much wildlife. It's a wonderful place to be and it was extremely windy and it just it, it added to the majesticness of the sights. I, I made a, a few mile hike basically out to Bright Angel Trail, Bright Angel Point. I hiked up around the Grand Lodge. There are a lot of people there, a lot of tourists. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I really need to emphasize here just how lucky I was in this trip. Because I decided to go on this trip about Thursday. And so I really only had a day to plan, but also a day to get reservations. It turns out that the motel that I stayed at in Kanab only had one room left, and it was only for Friday night. On Thursday, when I was making my plans, someone at the north rim of the Grand Canyon had actually canceled their campground reservation. But not for Friday night, only Saturday night. So that camp spot was actually occupied Friday night and occupied Sunday night. It was only that Saturday that it was available and it was the only one left in the campground. 
So finding that spot was extremely lucky. And after I was done hiking about five or six miles, I came back and I started to set up camp, had a nice meal, and after I finished, I decided to go out and look at the sun setting over the Grand Canyon. One of the most wonderful things I got to see on the trip, it was beautiful. The sun was setting, the lights changed how everything looked. It was just a really wonderful experience. I woke up at the Grand Canyon campground. It's basically a quiet policy until about 6 a.m. And luckily that's right about the time that I had woke up. I had a quick breakfast and I quietly crept my way out of the campground. Uh, driving out of the National Park with the sun at my back. Even though it was relatively warm at the Grand Canyon campground, there were parts of the Grand Canyon as I was driving out that were dipping down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, which was crazy to me that it was that much of a difference. Those small climate zones when you're up at about eight to 9,000 feet above sea level. I made a few quick stops as I was leaving the park, but I knew I didn't really have enough time to go hiking. The drive down and out of the National Park was really scenic, was really wonderful. I, I stopped and looked at trees. There's a quaking aspens that are these beautiful white barked deciduous trees. Uh, the spruce, all of it was just a beautiful sight. Quietly driving out of the National Park, it sort of compounds the sereneness of driving an electric vehicle. You're in this beautiful, majestic, quiet National Park, driving silently, not emitting anything, just taking it all in. It was wonderful. And then on the way back out, past Jacob Lake, and then back down to the Grand Escalante, just the view as the sun was rising up behind me and getting to see all of the colors spread out on the plains below, the plateaus, the mesas. It, it was truly gorgeous. But here's where my plan went awry. Previously, I had traveled to Utah to visit Zion National Park. It was beautiful, but I went early in the year when nobody was there. Well, I took the scenic byway down through Kanab and up and over so I could circle through because I had these grand plans to swing by the Zion Lodge where I had eaten lunch the last time I had visited, getting this majestic view as you eat your lunch. And unfortunately, during this time of year, the park is so crowded, they actually shut down the road up to Zion Lodge. Now, I didn't know that until I was entering the gates to Zion National Park. And by that point in time, it's really too late to turn around. And I figured I hadn't driven through that part of the park yet anyway, so I was really looking forward to the views. And the views did not disappoint. It was amazing. The sights that I saw going through Zion National Park, it was so beautiful, so majestic, it's hard to describe. However, there was so much traffic and so much congestion. I was literally sitting without moving for 20 to 30 minutes. Traffic didn't move at all, not an inch. People were shutting down their cars. People were getting out of their cars and just walking down the road, having conversations with people in other vehicles. It was, it was really, really bad. What I didn't realize is they were doing construction in the park, so they actually had shut down the tunnel so that it was only one lane of traffic. So after waiting about 20 to 30 minutes, we ended up driving through the tunnel and it made it all worth it. Getting through that tunnel and seeing what was on the other side, coming down these winding hairpin roads, just looking out at all of the tall, colorful cliffs. It was truly magnificent. I know that they have a number of level two chargers spread out throughout the National Park. And even though I couldn't go use the chargers at the lodge, I thought, well, it's been a long time I've been on the road. I've already been delayed. I really need to use the bathroom. I'm gonna stop at the visitor center where I know there's a charger. I'm going to try to plug in just to top up a little bit while I use the bathroom before I head out to St. George. Because as I said, the Mavericks in St. George was not cheap. So every kilowatt hour I could add to my battery at that point, the better. 
Unfortunately, when I got to the visitor center, it was extremely crowded. It took me a few minutes, but I finally found where the level two chargers were at the visitor center. I had never seen them there before. And because the first plug-in vehicle I had seen since I got off the freeway north of St. George was a plug-in hybrid, it left the only other charging space open. The entire parking space was full. All the signs were up, no more parking in Zion National Park. It was that crowded. But I was able to pull in and park, and I plugged in, and I couldn't charge. And I realized that unlike the Zion Lodge charger, this one actually required a code. So I went off to, to use the bathroom and find out, well, apparently you pay for the code and it's good for three days. Well, I wasn't gonna stay any longer, so I figured rather than paying for the code, I would just move as quickly as possible, open up the spot for any EVs that could possibly be arriving at the park, and then head off. But it's good to know that the next time I visit Zion National Park, you can actually go to the bookstore and buy a code that's good for three days. And you'll be able to activate it and charge as much as you want at the visitor center parking. The trip back to St. George through Hurricane out of Zion National Park was pretty uneventful. I've driven the route before and in worse weather. It was scenic, not as much in summertime as it was when I visited in late winter, early spring. But otherwise, there was really not much to say. I arrived back with plenty of charge, actually, when I got to the charge point charger at Mavericks. But this time, the Black Bear Dino was actually open, and I hadn't eaten, so even though I missed out at eating at the Zion Lodge, I was going to be able to eat while I charged. Back to what I had named as my number one challenge for this trip. It was already showing its head again. Those winds that had been blowing 20, 30, 40 out at the Grand Canyon nearly 50 miles an hour, they hadn't subsided. I thought if I had gotten out early in the morning, I'd be able to get out before those south-southwest winds started kicking up. And the problem with those winds are, from St. George, basically all the way until I get to Victorville, I was running into at best a headwind, at worst a front quartering wind. And those have significant impacts on your fuel efficiency. So I did charge up at St. George maybe a little bit longer than I would normally have needed to, but it turned out to be a very good thing. Because as I was driving into Vegas, I was getting slammed by these headwinds. So even though I was driving 75 miles an hour, the efficiency on my Bolt EV felt like I was driving 95 to 100 miles an hour. And even though I had intended to stop at the farthest terrible Herbst getting out of town, it turned out that that would be stretching my range to its max. Because of those winds, my efficiency had taken such a toll that I didn't want to dip that low into my battery and risk not making it to that terrible Herbst. So I stopped at the first one coming into Vegas. That terrible Herbst is the one that I don't like stopping at at nighttime because I don't feel like it's in the best neighborhood. And this one had some issues because of the way EVgo installed it. It's south facing. It's really hot. The touch screens on these units actually get warped due to the heat and they no longer work. I almost had to call EVgo technical service before I realized that it also has a hard button on the unit that allows you to start and stop the charger. And I decided I would much rather top up the far end of town. And again, because I wanted to use the bathroom and this terrible Herbst, as always, doesn't allow customers to use the bathroom. So I went ahead and cut my uh, charge short and then went on to the terrible Herbst at the far side of the town, the one closest to Baker. Now at this final stop in Vegas, I charged up to a almost 60%. And the reason for that is, again, I knew I was heading into a, a very strong headwind. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have needed to stay anywhere near that long. It's only 80 miles from that terrible Herbst into Baker. 
So really I was being very, very cautious by spending an extra 10 minutes or so there that I normally wouldn't need to spend. As I arrived in Baker, it turned out that I spent more time than I really needed to in Las Vegas. So despite the headwinds and the 100 plus degree temperatures that actually caused a significant amount of energy draw for battery conditioning along the drive, I still ended up arriving at Baker with 21% battery. So I did charge at least 10 minutes longer in Vegas than I really needed to. The charge in Baker went fine, but I wasn't looking forward to driving into the wind knowing that it would likely require me to stop in Victorville. Again, I had had enough of 100 amp charging over the course of this trip, and I really do think it's something that EVgo needs to look to address because 100 amp charging is sufficient for destination charging. It's really not ideal for interstate travel. The drive to Victorville, I was facing that really, really strong headwind. It was quite significant, but I didn't slow down. I basically maintained freeway speeds, or at least the freeway speeds that I'm comfortable with driving, the ones that I feel are safe. So I arrived at Victorville with about 4% battery left. I sort of made the decision along the route that rather than try to head down Cajon Pass into the Inland Empire and find a charger with such a low state of charge without really planning it ahead, I decided, no, I'll just stop at Victorville. It's a known quantity. If it's open, I'll charge there and have dinner. So I did. So even though it's only a 100 amp charger, I had an early dinner and so I really wasn't out the amount of time that it took to charge. Now I did make a mistake here though and I left with just over 40% battery which was not a good idea. I do know that from Victorville to Ventura County is pretty safe if you have about 50% battery. So I was leaving with less battery than I really needed and I thought well maybe I'll charge along the way at a charger that I've never used before. So I thought Calabasas certainly it's a wealthy neighborhood it would have a nice charger there at the community center so I decided I would stop there before cresting over the hill into Conejo Valley in Ventura County. The problem is, upon arriving, there was already a Nissan LEAF there. Now, it was a single unit station. The LEAF had only actually been there for about six minutes. I would have even considered waiting, except for the fact that it was a 100 amp charger. So rather than wait, I decided that with less than 10% battery, I would drive the remaining 16 miles to the Oaks Mall. But to keep it fun, rather than going on the freeway, I took the side roads. And I still arrived with about 3% battery. The Oaks Mall is really one of my favorite stops. There's a lot of food there. There are 225 amp chargers. Now I ended up charging to the taper point because I was also doing data logging for a better route planner. And a lot of times I noticed that we only seem to ever keep the car on and log data when it's a 100 amp charger. So I wanted to make sure I start to get more data on what the actual 125 amp charge sessions look like. So hopefully a better route planner can actually end up using that data to better estimate the Bull DB's trip times. All told, it was a 1200 mile trip that I did from after work on Friday until Sunday night. It was amazing. Yes, I wish I had more time. The traffic was a pain. The wind was a pain, you know? And yeah, I wish the Bolt EV would have faster charging available along the route. It will come in time, I know that. And it will save 15, 20 minutes per stop. But it's not there yet. And in the meantime, though, it's nice to know that the Bolt EV is as capable as it is. It's something that I've said for a very long time. The Bolt EV actually outdrives the current infrastructure, and that will continue to be true 
until Electrify America gets a majority of their new charger sites online. And at that point in time, we'll at least be able to see the full capacity of what this car can do. In the meantime, it's just amazing to me that I can go from Ventura County to the north rim of the Grand Canyon through Zion National Park and back home again on a two-day weekend and not burn an ounce of fossil fuels in my vehicle to do so. Now, some of you are probably interested in how much did this trip cost me. I'm not going to get into the costs of the room or the camping spot, but for the EV specific costs of it, after tallying up all of the costs for all of my charging stops, there's $84.94, but just round it up to $85. Now, a couple of things to consider there is one, I had more than enough range after returning home to drive the 35 to 40 miles into work the next day. So we won't count that. And just what I spent charging on this trip from start to finish was $84.94. The entire trip was 1,200 miles. So if you average that out, that's an average cost of about seven cents per mile. So I don't wanna speak for your vehicle or how much it costs you to travel. That's a little bit high for me personally in terms of how much I typically spend DC fast charging. It's about one to two cents per mile more than I like to spend on my regular 500 mile trips. But to give you an idea, this trip currently in a Bolt EV will cost you about seven cents per mile. Now, some other things that would play into that are because of my EVgo membership, I do get a certain number of minutes free or that are built into the membership but overall that's what I paid at the pump if you will. In terms of overall driving time it took me about 12 hours to get up to Kanab and then of course about another hour and a half two hours though a lot of that was lollygagging on my way from Kanab up to the Grand Canyon. Now, yes, in a gasoline-powered car, you would have made that trip faster. But because the primary impactor on that trip speed was actually traffic and congestion, even though it would normally be about eight to eight and a half hours in a gas-powered car for those of you who've actually made that trip from Ventura up to Kanab, you'd have to add about an hour to an hour and a half to that trip time just due to accidents traffic, and congestion. The same is true of the Bolt EV. If I had to estimate based on my experiences how much that trip would typically take me without the traffic and congestion, it would be about 10 to 10 and a half hours. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a little bit different style than the ride along videos that I normally do, but I figured a quick synopsis of a 1200 mile trip that I did over the weekend in my Bolt EV would give you all a better understanding of what travel in an electric vehicle looks like given the current state of the infrastructure and how good it could look as the infrastructure improves. Please let me know what you think of this video format, what you do like about it, what you don't like about it. I'm open to all sorts of feedback as long as it's civil and constructive. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel and helps me do more videos like this. And thank you for watching.